Welcome to the Jim Woods Podcast. I'm Ryan George. I'm Justin Guild, a.k.a. Chef Sonic. And I'm Tony Marinucci, a.k.a. Tips with Tony, your registered dietitian. And we are the Jim Wits. So, <laughs> Justin was up to some shenanigans today. Um, if you have been following our Instagram, you'll notice that Justin and I have both been kind of uh, posting our our food and to compare which, who's doing a little bit better, who's doing better, who's not. We're both trying to eat a little bit better. Um, so, today I came in and had a nice... You know, chicken salad, chicken with some salad, some rice. Uh, Justin saw how healthy that was, and he was preparing up some beans and what else did you have? Beans and brown rice, brown rice, right? And a smoothie, and and a smoothie. But he realized that mine looked healthier. So what did he do? He went into his fridge you have and like- grabbed some greens. He's like, I need some greens, and he <laughs> threw some greens onto his plates. Okay, good. So Justin's eating healthier. He's eating greens. He takes his picture. We both we both send him to Tony, who's been who's been kind of taking care of the uh, the the Instagram and social media stuff for us. Uh, which is why it's so much better now. And um, so Justin does that. As he sits down to eat, he literally takes a handful of the greens and throws it in the garbage because it was old. And he just put it to make it look better. So that was some BS. Um, I didn't and, post that yet. I'm debating what to, with, which one I should post. Yeah. So I'm hoping that that's not what you're doing all the time. No, no, but. no, no. I eat the greens. I like, I like the greens. I'm actually really good at cooking them when they're, they're fresh. Look, the, the deal was that, they, that the greens weren't good. They had gone bad. Okay. But... It made the plate look better. <laughs> That's why I actually have my clients take pictures of their food because yeah. they like don't even recognize. It's so interesting, yeah. right, Justin? You you were thought you were having something healthy, and you were, but that little addition of the greens after you looked at the picture, you're like, hey, I need to improve this a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yep. funny. So, yep. um, well, today we have another riveting discussion mm-hmm. with Emmeline Peaches, and I know that um, people have been asking for this. Discussion oh yeah, yeah. so while. yeah, uh, where's, I, I can't find the email right now, but um, we, we're pretty lucky in that we've gotten ninety nine percent, ninety five percent of the conserv- uh, conservative, conservative, um, positive feedback when we get stuff from people. But the few times we've gotten negative stuff, whether it's reviews or emails, has been about veganism. Um, and uh, so we were asked to have an actual vegan on um, because uh, I guess having an expert on the topic isn't. Uh, or expert on nutrition isn't good enough. So we went out and did that. If you ask the gym wits for something, we will do it. So we have... Most things. We'll do most things. <laughs> Fair enough. Most things. <laughs> Within reason. Um, so we have um, an actual vegan who will be discussing ethical veganism with us. So I think obviously, um, you know, we're dealing with the nutritional components. We want to try to stick with an expert, which is Tony. Um, but we have um, Emmeline Peaches, who was on uh, one of our more popular episodes, uh, and she's going to discuss ethical veganism as somebody who does practice um, veganism. So it's a good discussion. It's funny today. I had a whole plan. We we're going to do we, we, you know, we were trying a little bit different format, but the interview went over so long that I think we're going to start the new format in, in a couple of weeks. Yes, yes. So um, we'll go right to the interview again. It was really a lot of fun. Uh, I had a good time. So without further ado, here's our interview. Hey everyone, we are here with Emmeline Peaches for the second time. Hey Emmeline, how's everything? Hi, everything's well and thank you so much for having me back again. Oh, oh, of course. We loved the first discussion and we're very much so looking forward to this discussion. Um, What's new? Uh, Not too much actually. Well, I say that. I'm training for my second marathon, so that's a a little something or other. (laughs) Congratulations to Tony, by the way, on the half. Oh, thank you. I haven't ran since. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I was very much like that after my first marathon, so I can relate. <laughs> well, yeah, but thank you so much. I'll be following your progress. Oh, I'm thank so you. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So, for everyone listening in, we've had a few requests for this. We are going to discuss the hot topic of ethical veganism and veganism in general because Emmeline you are vegan so I am uh, indeed let's jump in first question is uh, what is veganism and what is uh, especially what is ethical veganism okay so obviously a lot of people nowadays know veganism as a dietary choice Um, specifically the decision to follow a strictly plant-based diet excluding all forms of animal-based products including things such as um, milk and eggs and honey Um, but veganism 
as it's defined by the vegan society, has always been really an ethical um, lifestyle approach. So the specific definition is a philosophy and a way of living which, which seeks to exclude as far as is possible and practicable all forms of expo exploitation of and cruelty to animals for food, clothing or any other purpose. So um, it's really there in the definition that veganism is in its, I suppose, purest sense, an ethical thing. But yeah. again, a lot of people are coming to it more from a dietary stance now, which is really cool, I do have to admit. Hmm. Um, so actually, my, I guess the question I, um, we, that just popped up is, do you, it's become somewhat of a fad. So I think there are a lot of people that are kind of jumping on the bandwagon purely because it's, mm -hmm. like a, it's become a, a dietary buzzword. As somebody who is who has embraced the you know embraced it for kind of the true meaning of it, is it frustrating that it, it does become a buzzword and a fad, which generally means people are going to do it and fail, and not stick to it, or is that is it more exciting that you do get people that are start that that veganism is becoming part of the kind of vernacular? Do you know it's always exciting to me to hear people willing to talk about and try veganism. Um, I am very optimistic about it and um, obviously it's good for me because it means that vegan food's becoming much more accessible, there's a, a more demand and supply for it um, and from my stance um, the hope is that people will try it and like it and see the benefits and continue with them but of course there is always that worry, that apprehension that people might approach veganism as a fad or think that they right. can just start it overnight and it's going to be easy whereas that's that's very rarely the case especially when it is done for just dietary reasons usually people who succeed at veganism do so because there, there's something behind that as with any lifestyle change yeah. it's when you have a, a fundamental um, belief or drive that wants to project you forward that you can take these things and make them more sustainable so i'm cautious but optimistic definitely so I guess we're wondering, why did you turn to veganism and how long have you been a vegan for? Um, well, I have been vegan for, it'll be coming up to three years soon. Wow. So obviously my PhD was um, very strongly rooted in animal studies and um, I, I do consider myself to be an animal lover and um, always have to some degree. But again, I ate meat for a very long time. Um, I considered one of the biggest rewards at the end of a long day a nice big piece of steak that was just oh, amazing to me. But um, as I was looking at these animal, um, well, human animal and non-human animal relations, I was realizing how much of a, a construct was there and, and seeing that and reading more about our relationship with other animals made me really question what was going into uh, how we eat meat, why we eat meat, what's surrounding it. And so I, I looked into, obviously, farming methods, modern farming methods. I looked into the environmental impact. I looked into um, health impact. And all of it was kind of coming up a little bit negative when it came to actually eating and consuming animals. We, we don't have the best practices nowadays. And uh, then Cecil the lion got shot. And I was like, oh, damn. And everyone was outraged. And I was outraged, too. And uh, my father's a fisherman. And I took a moment during that outrage and I thought, wait a minute. How is what my father does any different to this, this hunter shooting a lion? Why do I care more about this lion than I do about any of the fish that my dad brings up from the sea? And uh, come to think of it, about it, why do I care more about this lion than any of the animals that are dying for me to eat and I really had to sit down and, and think about it and at that time my diet was moving more towards vegetarianism anyway just in, in line with my fitness goals and I thought I'm gonna have to give this a try if I want to stay true to the fact that I, I care about animals and the environment and just see how it goes and I haven't really looked back um so uh, another question that just popped up is have you cheated at all in the three years of being a vegan? Not to my knowledge, okay, but cool. I don't think I don't think there's such a thing as a perfect vegan. Yeah. To be honest with you, we we all slip up every now yeah. and then, and God knows if I've I've eaten some cereal that might have had the wrong vitamin D in it or something like that. But uh, not intentionally, no. 
Okay, so, and actually, I guess that's an inter- interesting question bringing up Cecil the Lion, because I think that affected a lot of people. Um, now, why do you think it is that some that we can see, like, an, a lion getting shot or an elephant, um, someone with an elephant trunk as a, a trophy? Why does that affect people who can, at the same time, turn around and eat a steak that, you know, is... You know, an animal that's almost just as sentient, just as aware, can feel just as much pain. Why do you think it is that we can kind of disconnect from something that's on our plate, but but then we see you know this majestic animal and you know, get outraged? Uh, normality, really. I think most of us, uh, myself included, we're brought up eating meat and we and consuming animal products, and we do just consider it to be completely normal uh, obviously natural and to some degree it is natural and um, we just think of it as necessary a lot of people are like well if we don't eat animal products where are we going to get these vital nutrients and things from and so we we find all of these ways to to justify it and we we distance ourselves at the same time from those animals so um, a lot of us we don't like seeing animal suffering. We we definitely wouldn't want to see in um, a slaughterhouse or um, look at some of the modern farming practices. And I completely understand that because it's very distressing. But because we have this distance, which is a safety mechanism, we're protecting ourselves, um, it, it's easy enough to, um, I suppose, make it so that the, the then end product that we see, which is usually very different from the animal that it started at, is uh, just something enjoyable. Mm. I guess, Emmeline, I have a question because you brought up modern modern farming. But mm-hmm. so I guess at, at the end of the day, the unfortunate thing is that the animal does have to be killed or slaughtered. Um, so mm. when it comes to ethics, if, say, you knew that animal, you knew it was treated right, it was fed what it's supposed to be fed, it was give, you know, it had free range to go where it wanted, it was killed in a more humane way... How could you argue against that part when it comes to the ethical part of being vegan? I would say that I am all for animal ethics in the um, the current farming practices. Before I went vegan, I was a what I called a conscientious omnivore. So I was like, I'm okay for these animals to die for me as long as they don't suffer. And then mm-hmm. that's fine. And mm-hmm. um, I, that was an approach I took. And the the fact is, a lot of farmers do care about their animals, and they try their best. And um, what you do see is that a lot of them might actually feel sad, because come the end of the day, when those animals go to the slaughterhouse, they really can't regulate how they get handled and right. how they might die. Right. But um, either way, if I gave an animal the best of life, if I gave it the most fantastical things, I cared for it, I loved it, uh, or, or if the farmer did so, that animal still got to die. And um, it's just the case of what is the animal dying for in this mm-hmm. particular situation? When it comes to me, I mean, there are going to be some people who need me to survive. They're in that situation. But for me, it's just the case of convenience and familiarity. Mm-hmm. And is that really a good reason for an animal to die and I, I just couldn't justify it and at the same time no animal wants to die we all want to survive we all want to avoid pain death comes with inherent pain and obviously it's the end of a life a life that wants to keep on going absolutely sure so we're playing devil's advocate obviously um to, to oh, because it is such a, uh, a a great and interesting kind of philosophical dilemma and one that I think you know 100 years 200 years down the road will probably be past eating meat i i you know i'm willing to the, as meat, much of a meter as i am I'm willing to admit that that um you know we're, i'm probably on the wrong end of a moral issue right now but um we'll probably have a, a lab type meat yeah exactly so but so fairly shortly so but um so i guess the question the the argument i've heard and i don't i don't really agree with the argument but um there are some people let's say if you if you could argue that um, by farming, you know, by having livestock, you're giving life to animals that never would have had a life. And so as long as you treat them well and they live a decent life, is that objectionable? Because you're actually creating more life that maybe experiences, you know, a good, you know, a good, a good life. I'm sorry, I'm not thinking of the right word right now. But you, you kind of are, <laughs> are 
you're you're bringing more happiness theoretically before they die. Um, like, what would you say to that kind of an argument? If now, it makes any now sense? Now I'm starting to feel bad. Uh, <laughs> yes. uh, now it sounds really evil. I didn't articulate it well because I, again, I'm not one I subscribing to that you're argument, not. but I've heard something along those lines. Mm. Yeah. Firstly, don't feel bad. None of you feel bad, <laughs> please, because this is something we were all brought up with it's something we have all lived for the most part and it's just our culture it's society that there is i wouldn't say there's nothing wrong with um obviously consuming animal-based products but who how can we really blame ourselves when that's the system we're brought into essentially but also um in terms of the hypothetical it's really hard to contextualize that in the framework of modern farming practices because I can tell you now that those animals aren't going to be brought into lives that are particularly enjoyable and um, one way or another they're going to be shortened so it's hard to justify whether or not we bring those lives into the world and then they get killed um, very quickly compared to their natural lifespan Um, and all animals to some degree have an instinct to want to live as long as they can and um hmm it's very hard to say but i just don't think it's sustainable in our modern method so it's a, it's an odd hypothetical to bring to the table when it, it's not even possible really no that's fair it's, it is fair i think we do most people do not <laughs> we don't raise them in a situation where they're gonna you know their happiness will equal that of animals that not are just like, allowed feed, to live not enough to feed the world yeah, the no. yeah. <laughs> so um i guess uh, going back a little bit what are some reasons why people turn to veganism? So you know, you know, we've talked about a couple. And then what are some reasons that vegans fall off of, of that type of a diet or, and or lifestyle? Because obviously there's more um, to ethical veganism than just eating. Yeah. I think that a lot of people obviously nowadays are turning to veganism firstly because it's um, quite popular, um, which again, good and bad. I, I think a lot of people do it for animal compassion, um, those sort of connections where they they look at it and they think, uh, well, how is the pig any different to the dog when we take away our emotional attachments, etc. A lot of people nowadays are also doing it for environmental reasons and in order to try and help prevent or at least in some ways mitigate global warming. Then, of course, you have the immense... um, health evidence out there when it comes to veganism or I would say more uh, just a a, a whole foods healthier way of living it doesn't strictly need to be veganism but some people will look at that and say well veganism is is the good choice there and um, then of course I think you do have some people who turn vegan because people that inspire them are vegan as well or or are turning more towards veganism so it's a, a load of reasons as for why people might turn away from veganism i would say that a big reason is going at it too quickly um without enough information Mm. and then just not feeling very well not having the nutritional basis to make sure that they're they're sustained and they can go on and and then things are feeling dreadful and you're just like well clearly it's the fact that i don't have the animal products that are that is making me suffer rather than the fact that you don't have those those vital nutrients and the things that your body needs to go forward. I think there's a lot of societal pressure. Friends and family is a big one. And um, to some degree, I think people just really, really love and you know are attached to animal-based products. And, and that's completely fair. We, we, we all have those emotional and social attachments. And culturally too. Oh, definitely, and definitely. A lot of families, like growing up with certain recipes and traditions. So, yeah. Yes, I was just about to say one of the hardest things going to vegan is to think well, I'll never have like my nana's spaghetti bolognese in the same mm. way again, or I'll never have this this toffee apple. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, we can reinvent them. It's yeah. it's not the same, yeah. but yeah, and it's a struggle. It, it's something that you have to emotionally reconcile along the way. I think you said something really important in the beginning, which is you made the decision that you're kind of you're committed to this. And the reason why people kind of fall off is because they go into it too quickly. They, they don't commit to it. But at the end of the day, if you make a decision that you're going to do something, you're going to make it work for you and your lifestyle. Mm, yeah, definitely. I think 
commitment is the thing that we all have at the end of the day when that initial motivation fades away mm -hmm. and um, it, it's best um, best implemented when you have a, a solid plan you've done your research and you feel confident moving forward and you can adjust and you, you accept the slip-ups because we all slip up it, it, it happens so I guess this ties in how much work and effort is it to really follow a vegan lifestyle? Um, I, I read posts, people say, oh, you know, the, the food is delicious and it's good, right? But they don't talk about, well, it takes a lot of effort. There's a lot of research involved, right? It might be very expensive as well if you, to buy certain foods. Like, what is entailed in this lifestyle? Mm -hmm. Uh I'm reminded of just fitness in general. What is it that you often say? Truth doesn't sell. Truth doesn't and, sell. Um, yeah. Usually it's a case of, as with any dietary or big lifestyle change, we want the quick fix. We want it to be easy. We want it to be instantly delicious and we know everything and we can just, just hit the ground running. But really it is a case of if you're going to make any change, um, especially if you're in a fitness setting and you need to factor in your additional calories and nutrients, you need to make sure that you have done the research. And there is a learning curve. There's definitely a learning curve. And um, those first few days, you're, you're going to feel confused and it's going to seem hard and you, you might feel a struggle. You might miss things. And um, in those instances, it's just a case of making sure that you have a good uh, support network in place, making sure that you have the resources um, I highly recommend social media and support groups because there are some fantastic ones out there. And um, it's sometimes a case of being comfortable with and accepting that veganism and any lifestyle change isn't always going to be perfect and there will be struggles mm -hmm. and that's okay. And um, what I found is I, I did struggle a little bit at first, but when you do something consistently enough and it goes from being that new thing to being a habit and just a sustainable part of your life, you don't even think about it. It becomes second nature, but you will have to deal with that initial learning curve. Yeah. Um, so I guess we'll go on to fitness because we were talking, uh, you brought, we mentioned a little bit. Um, what, uh, so I guess there, there's a kind of a misconception for people that, you know, vegan, you know, eating a vegan diet means you're going to be low on energy and that it's not conducive to putting on muscle and working out, you know, at your maximum. So I guess, how do you dispel that myth or is it not a myth? And, um, you know, what can people do? You know, so as someone who's vegan, who, who tr trains in a, an, an endurance event, how do you keep your energy and keep your strength, you know, while you're also preparing for something that requires really a good deal of energy, both mentally and physically? Uh, for me, oats, dates and bananas are a godsend. That's all I'll say. <laughs> but um, in general, if you go about veganism the wrong way you may very well feel tired because it is it's so easy to um underestimate the amount of calories that you're getting and um so i would say that for anyone who is going into it it's worth um approaching it with the fitness mindset of perhaps tracking your calories or tracking your, your macros and uh, maybe even seeing a dietitian to get on the right track so that you know you, you approach and you say this is what I want to do mm -hmm. I, I this is what I currently do in terms of fitness and performance can you help me with this and you get the professionals in if you need it but in terms of veganism hindering someone with fitness um, that really doesn't seem to be the case I mean obviously one of the biggest downsides of veganism is because it is so recent because it's gaining very uh, well gaining traction most recently uh, there's not a whole lot of research out there we know that there have been some very big studies that have shown that vegans tend to have the healthiest bmis um the china study is something that has been brought up and has been contested and is going back and forth but in terms of the anecdotes we have people like Scott Jurek, ultramarathon runner, current world record holder in, um, in that regard, who is doing perfectly fine on a vegan diet. We have um, who was once Germany's strongest man, Patrick Baboumian, and uh, again, he's doing fantastically. Um, and then you have people like 
Kendrick Ferris, our current um, American Olympic weightlifter, who again is vegan, record breaker in terms of fitness and sports and performance. Uh, and the list goes on and on with vegan athletes. So we know that it can be done. It's just a case of um, getting enough people who are interested in fitness, who are also vegan, who would also submit themselves to studies so that we know the exact details of that. Yeah, and I think you mentioned you said something that makes a lot of sense for anyone. Usually athletes are really, you know, they probably have a nutrition expert looking at their meal plan and making sure mm-hmm. they're getting adequate amounts of carbs and protein and fat and that balance there. So no, like any diet, if it, no matter what the food consists of, if it's basically balanced in the right way and geared toward the goal, it's going to work. So it's just a matter of making sure that it's adequate enough, whether being vegan or not, if it's adequate enough, then you're going to be able to perform better. Exactly. And the as far as I know, the current consensus among um, the American and the UK health services is that a vegan diet can sustain you at all parts of your life yeah. and no matter your fitness level. So it is just a case of pursuing, again, a healthy, sustainable diet. Yes. Yeah. So um, I guess, so, so as in like ethical vegan, when, you know, it comes to the exploitation of animals, I think that, you know, a large part of human history has been on the backs of exploiting animals and other humans. So mm. I guess at, at what, is there a level where it's okay? You know, let's say, you, you know, is there any level where it's okay or is it never okay? Because, you know, again, obviously there, you know, lots, you know, our society arguably would not have grown so where it was without, without it being on the backs of animals and people, you know, unfortunately. And so, you know, yeah, is there, is there like a line, and I'm sure this is probably something that's up for debate within the community, but is, I guess, if you can tell me too, what's your personal belief and maybe what's the consensus, if there is one or close to a consensus in the, in the vegan, ethical vegan community, like where do you draw the line of like, okay, it's no longer okay to, to exploit animals? It would definitely be up for debate i can tell you that and obviously these are the ethical quandaries that keep us uh, keep a lot of us awake at night but the wonderful thing about veganism is it's right there in the definition we we try and exclude these things as far as is possible and practicable mm-hmm. so for example vegans are trying to exclude animals from their diets and now part of animal agriculture is oh plant-based agriculture sorry is that insects are going to get killed in part of that and they're going to be in our food to some degree uh, obviously farmland or, or just na- natural land is going to be cleared it's an inevitability and of course medicines these vital things that we have in our lives that we do sometimes sadly n- need to do research on animals on or that have an animal-based product in them and if, if it's a life-threatening situation if there is if you weigh it up and you can see that then all you can do is try your best and sometimes you do have to accept that animals may suffer or be exploited as part of that and (coughs) is is suffering the criteria that that you really kind of are is is where you base the kind of philosophy around is basically the animal's ability to suffer or and then is there kind of a hierarchy like I'm assuming a cockroach doesn't suffer as much as, you know, a a baboon and a bat, or um, that's a good example. A cockroach doesn't suffer as much as a mouse and a mouse doesn't suffer as much as a baboon. Um, So, so yeah, is it, are there, are there hierarchies? And and again, is suffering like the criteria? You should have said cow. We don't eat baboons. (laughs) I was just thinking of animals. I I wanted to go like very low sentience or assumed low sentience and then climb the ladder. It's um, strictly exploitation and cruelty when it comes to the official definition, but I do think it's so subjective. Each person's going to have their own approach to it. Um, I personally don't believe that an insect is going to be of the same cognitive ability as a pig. I mean, that's ridiculous. Pigs are as um, intelligent, we think, as some five-year-olds. They can outstrip dogs in terms of intelligence. Uh, (laughs) They, they change the, the heating systems of their living conditions if you actually give them access to that sort of thing. Um, a cockroach, probably not so much. But um, I, I do think at the end of the day, most vegans are concerned with if we can avoid 
this this cruelty, this exploitation, no matter what the animal, no matter what our personal opinions of it, and no matter how smart it is, because if we start judging whether or not we can exploit or be cruel to some individual based on how smart they are, that's a very slippery slope in terms of thinking about it. So it is, um, we try to, I suppose, not see all animals on equal terms, but at least give them an equal footing when it comes to trying to avoid exploiting them or being cruel to them. Hmm. I think that the um, the part of it that is sort of in, in a reasonable or, or practical is is very important because there are some ethical dilemmas, right? If you were um, if you are uh, an ethical vegan, but perhaps w- would it be okay to say drive an SUV that guzzles gas? <laughs> And might be very harmful for the environment or use certain products that may not have been tested on animals but might be bad for the environment or to buy clothing made by child slave labor, like something exactly. like that. Like these are ethical – like it's like where do, you, where do you draw the line with that? Exactly. And I think that's what it comes down to, isn't it? Where do we all personally draw the lines? And – it is a, a constant ongoing battle and I think that we all try our best to figure out what we're comfortable with, what we can conceivably do within our means as well because sure. not everyone has the accessibility to live entirely within their ethics. And um, I agree with you. This is something that we, we haven't hashed out and we can't be perfect and it is just a case of, of balancing up the odds. So as um, I we brought up before, like um, jokingly, um, although some didn't uh, appreciate the joke, I brought you brought up that like gummy bears are 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 technically not vegan, and uh, or no, not technically, they're not vegan, and there are plenty of no. you know products that aren't vegan. Now we talked about vegan condoms, and we um, during the last episode um, with you, and uh, so. What what do you you know as an ethical vegan and as somebody who's you know again this is a lifestyle so it's not just that you're just saying I'm a vegan and you're just going to go about your life and eat whatever but if it's a lifestyle you subscribe to what yeah. what's the responsibility of the person to make sure that the the environment that they interact with it, it, you know kind of um, re- works with that lifestyle as much as possible like do I do you you know, should you kind of check every product you buy, you know, you know or or you know, where's the, that limit um, as somebody who does subscribe to that. Uh, we do have vegan gummy bears now. They're yes. not yeah, so bright. <laughs> <laughs> um, they do exist. Uh, so that's something most most vegans will try and substitute if they feel really passionately about something. I suppose this, this answers your question to some degree. If a vegan's really missing something, then chances are you can Google it and there's already a recipe out there from another vegan who missed it and hodgepodge <laughs> something together themselves with the recipe. But... Um, In terms of how far you take it and um, looking at ingredients for food, I think it's generally good practice every now and then to really have a look at your food and the ingredients that are involved in it and how that might impact your body just from a health perspective. And um, when you're vegan uh, or when you're thinking about going vegan, you'll usually easily find a list online of things that are going to be on an, an ingredients list to uh, that are okay and things to avoid and at first it is uh, again you're learning essentially a new way of reading products a new way of reading and interacting with your food but it it does become second nature so i think it's a good practice to start with at first and then you'll get used to it but more so than that when i when i convince people to try veganism or when i've seen people try it online what you'll usually get rather than oh god how hard is it to look at all these ingredients is oh my god i can't believe that i've never paid attention to hmm. my food before and what yeah. goes into it and what's actually in this stuff because people we all love to some degree food we we have a, a complex relationship with it multifaceted as we've discussed but we're so distanced from it in certain ways and we don't even think about it and to then to then have something in your life that makes you really confront that it could be a really interesting and exciting thing sure. uh, yeah so I'm, I'm i might get flamed for what i'm about to say but <laughs> can vegan <laughs> is can can veganism be brought to the level of almost a fundamentalist religion like something like say 
PETA, and I don't know your opinion on PETA, that is um, pretty much vehemently anti anything that would have to do with animals, including uh, having a pet, including testing cancer drugs on rats, mm-hmm. on anything of that nature. Um, can it be brought to a, a degree that is unreasonable, in your opinion? And I'm just curious what you think of PETA and organizations like that or people that share sort of fundamental, fundamentalist-esque beliefs. Um, yes, it can definitely be um tipped over the edge again i believe we talked about this in the previous interview i did with the body love movement and people using it to perhaps encourage unhealthy habits anyone um if they want to can take a movement can latch onto it and can bring it to some really toxic places Mm. and with veganism especially ethical veganism it can be so easy at times because not only is it a movement that's gaining traction so you're easily going to get a platform but a lot of people who do first come to ethical veganism discover what happens to animals what it's causing to the environment and they're 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 angry rightfully so or they're upset and they 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 get to this very jaded and upset position in their lives and it does become difficult for them to manage Uh, when when you suddenly turn around and what you once saw as food is now dead bodies uh, and you're seeing everyone totally fine with that for for a new vegan or for a very passionate vegan that can be a very hard thing to reconcile yeah. and it, it can lead to extremism um or purism people who are like you cannot have the the slightest hint of even a tiny grain of, of, of this food if it was cooked in the same area as an animal is just unclean for me basically um and for that, I would say, for the people who are struggling with that, I completely understand. But how is that helping the overall movement? How is that helping your personal well-being? I think as well, we need to remember other humans or animals. They come under the paradigm of veganism in that we don't want to see anyone else suffer. We don't want to be cruel to anyone else. And perhaps if you're taking too extreme, too extreme an approach, not only are you presenting yourself in a way that might damage veganism as a whole, but you're hurting other people who are technically under the paradigm of animals. I think that's a great, uh, great answer. And it d- does tend to happen with all, all kinds of things as we're seeing in our own kind of world right now. Yep. Uh, you know, in every walk of life, it seems you get um, ex- the extremes Extreme. and they're always the loudest. And yeah. I think that oh, becomes yeah. an issue sometimes with, with veganism is that I know plenty of people who are kind of who are like you, who are very reasonable and realistic. And then I, I do know the kind of militant ones who mm-hmm. are a little a little extreme and, and and it's not how you get people on your side, you know, then you it becomes a it becomes you know Nobody likes to be preached to. Yeah, exactly. Nobody we're told, likes to be we're told what they're doing is completely like wrong. You know, there's yeah. never gonna be an approach you wanna get with some, to help someone. Nobody wants to feel like and nobody intends to you know, feel like they're they're hurting or they're murdering or they're they're just in any way inflicting damage upon animals. Especially if you consider yourself as an animal lover, nobody wants to be told you're wrong. Nobody wants to be shouted at. Nobody wants to be abused, and nobody should have to go through those conditions. Nobody should be subjected to aggression and distress yeah. when it's unnecessary. There are other ways to promote veganism and um i think it is just a case of showing how how possible it is and how enjoyable it can be and how beneficial it can be Mm -hmm. and um i do i do think that there is a place for all forms of activism in every single spectrum but some people do take it too far as for peter because i didn't answer that (laughs) i think that they are very much operating on all scales of the spectrum which makes them a very hard Um, organization to reconcile with so on the one hand peter does stuff and i look at it and i go why peter why uh why are you doing this Mm -hmm. but on the other hand they currently have a fantastic accidentally vegan snack food resource i will Mm -hmm. link everyone to Mm -hmm. because it will let you know right there 
44 or more things that are vegan that you would never think of, things such as beef pot noodles or Oreos or, you know, these chocolate chunk biscuits that anyone can buy in stores. And it's just really good to have that resource. And, and it's a reasonable resource. So even with the extremist um, side of things, you can sometimes reap some benefits from it. And it's about how you approach these things. So um, you, you know that Oreos were at one time not vegan, I think, yeah. They used to be made with pig pig lard back in the day. Certain Oreos are still not vegan as well. (laughs) And uh, sometimes it varies from country to country as well, which is really um, frustrating. I believe that um, in the US, McDonald's uses a beef seasoning on their fries as well, whereas in Europe they don't do that. Or Mm. there are some some things that you have to double check, especially if you're a traveling vegan. Hmm. Um, and again, Google is God with some of these things. Which is, which, and just sort of a, uh, a question about the, you mentioned McDonald's. Um, I would almost never eat there at McDonald's, even if I were to get the fries, just because of, well, maybe the fries are vegan. What they do, they're, of, they're probably the biggest, you know, purveyors of meat in this country, right? Of, 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 of horrible factory farming practices. So yeah. would it be wrong to eat at McDonald's just because you are patronizing a company that is one of the, the major players in one of the, the, in the thing that vegans want to fight against the most? Do you know, it's a, a huge debate right now as well because McDonald's have just released the McVegan as well, the, the vegan burger. And on the one hand, you have this resource that will help more people try vegan food and perhaps enjoy it and experience it and then perhaps turn to veganism. But you also have McDonald's, which, as you've highlighted, is a very problematic company. They're, they're not doing the best practices. I personally haven't stepped in one since I was about 14 years old uh long before i went vegan it was for other ethical reasons as you might imagine um i think it's a case of meeting people where they're at so Mm. if you're ethical if you already believe and practice um avoiding those sort of places then there's no reason to walk back in there because their fries are vegan or anything like that but if you have a friend who you know likes mcdonald's they're thinking about going vegan they just can't possibly imagine going whole foods plant-based uh, for all of the health benefits that might come from it but they know that they like a, a, a mcdonald's burger and that's their main comfort then that very first step might just be saying to them we'll try the mcvegan when it comes to the u.s mm. and see how you go from there and that might be a stepping stone for them. So it's all about, in every instant, treating it as you come to it and being pragmatic if you want to have the biggest ethical impact, I think. God, the yeah, big vegan, I, that just sounds so well, wrong. I think that's I so know. many levels to me. <laughs> it's so wrong. Exactly. I know, and it, it hurts. But, it's <laughs> but I, I think that's a perfect answer because if you're too militant, then you will turn people off. But, you know, you yeah. hope, you'd hope that... Somebody starts with the McVegan, likes it, and then as they get more engrossed in the lifestyle, they're able to kind of extricate yeah. themselves from their need to to eat McDonald's. I- I'll tell um, you my my, uh, my McDonald's story, which basically turned me off from McDonald's. Remember when someone had the McRib back in the day when yeah. they had the McRib, which is a boneless uh, piece of you know piece of pork. I, I believe. used to love the McRib when I was a very young teen. Yeah, but but they bit into the McRib and it had bones in it, but it wasn't pork oh, bones God. it was a mouse that no. was on it oh and ever since oh. then i it was very hard for me to go back to mcdonald's but oh. the guy sued mcdonald's for like <laughs> millions of dollars so the question is would you eat a mouse for millions of dollars oh my god that's a good question i would absolutely <laughs> exactly. no doubt and interestingly what's the difference between eating mouse meat no, and eating no 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 eating mouse meat is that no. there that's the that's different, it, it that's different. Mind, no it's different to me oh, it's, it's different to me because exactly. you know i'm scared of yeah. of, of, of mice oh, so. Oh, <laughs> and, and there was that recent Burger King scandal as well. It's going viral right now, isn't it? Where someone's found a load of maggots in the oh. in there. Oh, I man. know it, it, it makes you cringe. It <laughs> it really does. See. And obviously, you could get insects in in the lettuce or something like that. Yeah. But yeah. when you see it on that scale, it's like, oh god. Oh, mm. Well, I, I heard something, and I, I could be, I could, it could be wrong or I could be off by something but I remember in in an ethics class my uh, my degrees in philosophy I remember in ethics class 
so I don't I forget the context, but we were talking about the meat industry and that when meat's ground up, like occasionally, you know, a farm worker's hand gets caught in and some of the bit's finger gets mm-hmm. caught in the meat. And there is a certain acceptable, allowable amount of like human parts in the meat. So like yeah, if you have like a giant vat of the meat and the finger gets caught, they're not going to toss it out. It's just that there's like yeah. an acceptable percentage. I don't know how much of that's true, but I do remember, you well, know, there is. professor the talking about too. that. There's and, bugs and, and, yeah. stu- and so. stuff in the, in the grain supply. I don't, I don't think your human blood though is allowed. Cause I know in, when foods, I mean, maybe back in the day, but yeah. now if there's any sort of blood, they have to stop oh, working okay. immediately, wrap their finger and mm. make sure it's fully cooked. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I could be wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be I'm not, not, I'm not right. too sure about yeah. that one either. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, uh, I had a question. So, uh, what do you, you know, so, so probably my my <laughs> least favorite type of person is someone who kills animals for pleasure. Like I think mm. that you know, like I don't, I, I, I don't tech generally. Like I actually think that somebody who hunts and they kill the animal and then eat the animal, you know, skin the animal and you know, package it up and cut and eat. Cook. I actually think they're, they're more ethical in some ways than I am because I just leave it to other people to do it and I get to avoid all the ugly stuff and then I just get the, the nice chunky piece of meat. Where someone who actually kills, you know, kills the animal themselves, hunts, kills, eats the animal, that's fine. But people who just do it for fun, big game or hunters, sport, trophy yeah. hunters, I think they're among the worst kinds of people. Like, I, I'm sorry if you're a listener. Um, I just, I just oh. don't <laughs> understand the... the because it means that you like killing stuff, yeah, and and there's a, some pleasure you take out of killing stuff. And I I know hunters will say that that you know they have their arguments and that it's a sport and blah blah blah. But at the end of the day, to me, and I could be wrong, um, and I'm sure we'll get some hate mail, is that you just like killing stuff. And so, what do you say? I, I don't know why I went into that rant because it really doesn't have anything to do with my question. But I guess what do you say to somebody who who kind of feels like, well, humans are at the top of the food chain. If we're able to do it, survival of the fittest. Who cares? Like we should be able to do what we want with our animals and kill them. Like what would you say to somebody that kind of has that mindset, or do you say anything to somebody with that kind of mindset? Um, I think obviously just because we can do something doesn't mean that it's ethical, and that's obviously where I would come in yeah. and say. Yeah, you can do that, but why are you doing it? So, for example, with the hunter, even if the hunter is going to kill that animal and then eat it, it's a case of, yeah, but why are you doing that? And usually it's a case of, in our modern Western world, I'm doing it because I enjoy the taste of that meat. And it's like, I can appreciate that. All I'm asking is whether or not that enjoyment, again, you're killing an animal for something you enjoy, um, is worth that animal's life to you. And if it is, then I can't change your mind. No one can change someone's mind if they don't want to. All I can do is present the information and say, do you feel like this ethically and logically makes sense when you take away the cultural dependence, the the upbringing, and when you really sit down and think about it? And then it's up to people where they come with that. Hmm. So, um, well, do you you follow up for that? Oh, no. Any... Um, no, I'm, I guess I'm actually kind of wondering, like, if you, if you have someone, because I used to look, view it as, like, I know, you know, growing up in New York, I have some friends that I went to college or their family was from more upstate where hunting was pretty regular for them and they would, you know, hunt deer and then go home, skin it and eat it. And I, I actually respected that rather than going to the grocery store, kind of what Ryan was saying. But now I'm kind of yeah. thinking on the flip side of it is... Like what? What? Like kind of what you're saying is like, what's the purpose of killing when you can just go purchase it and now going that extra step? Like I, I don't know. I guess either way, it, it really has to come down to the person's view. Well, I, I, the argument I would think is, for ethically, almost it, you're you're supporting an industry that that causes the suffering or allows for the suffering of animals. So like, if you just go to the grocery and buy that. The, that you're you're putting your money into that industry, right. where if you just go and you go and shoot a deer that's lived a good life and that's been happy, you know, and hopefully you don't miss. And that's the other problem is that if you miss the mm. shot, then then they're they're severely they're injured terrified. and then they're in pain and then oh, there's all that God. stuff and you know uh, yeah I don't it'll make like you know what if you kill a mother deer with little baby deers Stop so it. so we're, <laughs> let's let, let's forget all that. I would think that it, in it's a way it's too late to forget. It, it, it's also like you you are now part of the process, like because I can disconnect myself from the process, and in, in some ways that is you know it, it gives me you know some level of um, it, uh, I'm trying to think of acceptability, like, you know, huh? Like your acceptability, yeah, like or, or yeah, I'm kind of I'm impl- I'm 
I'm part of this process now and I buy into it and, and I'm complicit in it where, yeah, the person that goes and hunts and does it, like they're doing it. At least they're getting into it. It's like they're, mm-hmm. they're, they're actually, you know, they're, they're, it's, it's kind of a circle and they, they they're within the circle because they don't, they don't have to put money into an industry. They're just killing the animal. They take the animal, they do all the work. So in some ways I feel like that's just more ethical than me. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily that it is ethical, but just that it's more ethical than than me, who I'm just you know I'm disconnected from everything, and I just get to pick up the meat. Yeah. I don't get to see the 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 cow before it's killed. I don't get to see the eyes. I don't because because I, I love animals, mm-hmm. and you know I mean like for example I love I love uh, I, you know pigs taste great, but when we were in Thailand we were with a couple of wild hogs and. They were so sweet, and the whole time I'm thinking at the same time, wow, this is so, they're so cute, but you taste so good, yeah. and there's that like moral <laughs> dilemma. So, but if I I couldn't though kill the thing as good as it might taste, I couldn't sit there and kill it. I couldn't shoot it. Like I would, mm. I'd feel horrible. But I'm I'm complicit in the process. So I guess that was the you know that's my this is what my kind of take on it as far as like yeah, you know yeah. why it's probably being the hunter that's hunting to eat the food is maybe a little bit more ethical than the you know person who goes to the grocery and purchases you know i feel you i really do and it's so hard to reconcile the fact that i love this animal but i i pay other people to kill it for yeah. me so that i can have that taste which is enjoyable and uh Again, you can you can throw yourself through so many mental and ethical hoops about is is killing this animal in this situation better than killing this animal in that situation. Technically, the hunter has a, a much better grasp of where their food is coming from, what's involved in getting it, the process of taking a life, etc. Does that make it justifiable? Alternatively, I just found that the easier option was that when I don't have to have any of these animals die for me when i'm in a position where that is perfectly fine no animal needs to die i can still have my meals i just opted for the route where i I didn't have to try and justify or or even get into whether or not one animal's death was better or more ethical than another's because they were all unnecessary Hmm. so uh so going back to so last episode we talked about um vegan condoms and so i was wondering are, is are there examples of vegan fitness equipment or you know equipment that maybe is not vegan that we should be aware of so you know kind of going back to to, to fitness a little bit um can you give us yeah. any examples of that absolutely um when i started um going to the gym a bit more i noticed that obviously some of the weightlifting belts are made of leather i started mm. to when i ran i started to think okay well my shoes aren't leather because most running shoes typically aren't but what glue is involved in the process and it won't always be vegan so when you're looking at fitness gear it's very important as an ethical vegan to try and consider um, whether or not what you're using is in line with your morals and your values and uh, sometimes as with anything really um, you may be surprised to find that it's it's not so it really doesn't hurt to when you're buying new gear looking into is this shoe or is this brand vegan do you do vegan things Uh, what are the vegan alternatives so for example uh, as far as I know, most of Brooks running shoes are vegan. You can find um, faux leather substitutes for weight belts. And um, obviously a lot of protein powders now, you can find perfectly adequate vegan protein powders. And um, through asking these questions and through doing these searches, through making sure that your fitness equipment is vegan, you're not only keeping in line with your own values, but you're also showing the fitness industry that there is a demand for vegan clothing vegan equipment and um they can match that if they want to and there's a market there and in that way you're propagating it even further um the only thing is obviously i can't help it sometimes if the weight equipment has lever on it and uh, uh you know again as far as is possible and practicable but well, we always say use uh free weights are the better option anyway so yeah those are made of metal Although the, the, the bench is made of, the bench, the bench is made of, it's true, the bench is made of leather, but no, it's true. So, um, I, one of the more, so recent fad, uh, so, well, I guess I, I'll start again. Um, one of the more, the dumber arguments against veganism is uh, people say, oh, well, lions eat meat. So if lions eat meat, why is it okay for them to? But we can't, and obviously we know why, because we're, we're you know, we're, we're sentient we're intelligent we can find alternatives we understand morals 
et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the, the weirdest fad I've read about recently is that people, people feeding their pets vegan. Um, mm. And also, you know, baby the vegan diets on kids. But anyway, um, is that something, the kind of pet, you know, is that something in the community or do you think it's as crazy as I think it is kind of giving, you know, feeding a dog or a cat on a vegan diet? Cats are obligate carnivores, which means that they, for the most part, will need to have meat in their diet. If you're not giving them meat, then chances are that they're going to get it themselves if they go out hunting, which is a common practice in the UK. Um, And if you try and give your cat a vegan diet, then you might find that it struggles with taurine. And usually what a lot of vegans will say, even ethical vegans, is that it's always a case of putting the welfare of the animal that you have before anything else because if you've taken on that life and you say that you're going to avoid that life going through cruelty that means giving it a diet that is adequate for it um dogs can sometimes turn to vegan diets it's entirely possible um the world record holding dog in terms of lifespan right now is a vegan dog which (laughs) was a really surprising fact for me and um as a dog historian very interesting um my own dog did not take to a vegan diet and for health reasons i would not then impose that on the animal Uh, i think that the best way for vegans to get around this is to either only, if they're not comfortable with it, only take on pets that can sustain a vegan diet. For example, I have two snails that are perfectly happy eating vegan (laughs) alongside (laughs) me. (laughs) Uh, And hedgehogs as well. Um, But they obviously aren't always on a vegan diet because they need some insects in their diet. Um, those were rescues. So if you're taking on a rescue, just do the best that you can. Uh, don't force any animal that cannot naturally sustain themselves on veganism to go vegan just because you are. Yeah, I had a reptile. Uh, Euromastix is one that that um, mm. they're they're I guess vegan. Like they they eat mostly fruits and vegetables, uh, mm. or all fruits and vegetables. They can't eat like insects, but you, they're not a required part of their diet. Yeah. And, and that's a good way to get around it if, if you're comfortable with having pets again or, or companion animals because, again, not all vegans will be comfortable with even that practice. Hmm. Mm. All right, so we mentioned we would talk a little bit about this. Um, we won't go into a full review because it's this interview. Actually, Wow, the time really flies when we're speaking with you, Emmeline. So oh. you, you have, the, have the best... Um, I sure hope that's a good thing. Oh, it's the, it's the best. It's the best. So I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about the, the What the Health documentary. I know that you yeah. had some opinions on that, as do I. Um, mm. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you the floor uh, first off. I know Tony might have some opinions on it as well. So I'm just curious what you thought about it in general. I'm still waiting for that podcast. I do have oh, to yeah. admit. We, we, we'll, um, we ha- we'll, we'll, we'll definitely do it soon. But for me, um, there's a divide between British documentaries and American documentaries anyway that, that made it quite a... Um, interesting thing to watch because American documentaries are quite bombastic in some way and sure. sometimes that can be fantastic and other times it can be infuriating and again some British documentaries are very dull and dry and mm. sometimes that's great and sometimes you're just there like come on live enough a bit sure, um, sure. but for me I was really concerned with what I perceived to be some leading questions that were being asked by the director I felt that the way that the health questions were being presented were deliberately set up to scare people. And I just, I don't feel like that's the best approach, especially when you feel, if you feel confident in your research, um, if you feel confident in the benefits of a whole food plant-based diet, which that there's no reason not to feel confident that whole foods will help a person uh, plant-based or not. It's always better to try and uh, shoot for that then I'm I'm not too sure why that approach was taken. And that that just does not sit quite right with me. And then obviously there's the case of I don't have the full educational background to say whether or not all of the scientific stuff was sound, but I know that Tony was a little bit sad about it as well. So, yeah, I, I'm interested in your thoughts. 
Yeah, well, the the one the one big thing that like I tell any, anyone is there's not one fits all diet, and the whole documentary was basically saying no matter what your past medical history, no matter where you're at, whatever, no matter what medications you're taking, it really it probably I wouldn't be surprised if some people just stopped taking their medications and went vegan. Like it was it was too extreme in the approach that really was unsettling to me. And I, I personally actually then had clients coming in who had watched the documentary who wanted to go vegan. And as a, as a dietitian, I was supportive with them, but they did have diabetes. Their blood sugars immediately shot yeah. up da- to dangerous levels. Um, yeah. You know, and they, they, they didn't take the time to do the research. They didn't have the time to, you know, kind of talk with me first. They kind of just went for it. And from that perspective, like you were saying, it really did try and scare people rather than educate them. I think they spent maybe three minutes saying oh no eating vegan's healthy and it's actually cheaper but the whole other part of the documentary was just like you said setting up for for reasons why we would be for it but not showing the other sides to it that it is not Mm -hmm. one size fits all and there's a lot of things that come into play a lot of things we need to consider before applying and like you said and which is true with any diet you have to start slow and gradually work your way up to it and see if it if your body can adjust and can be good for you because there's a, I mean, this is could be we can go on for this forever, but there's a lot of parts to the vegan diet that that can be hard for someone to follow. Um, yeah. And it kind of was just like this is for anyone, no matter what, and it made a lot of other ridiculous claims. That, yeah. You know, I, I think the, the the ones that really sort of got me were um, the um, the stuff about sugar, where mm-hmm. they. It, it basically claiming that sugar doesn't have a detrimental effect on people. It's like, oh, you can eat a lot of sugar. It's not good for you, but yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, like pictures of, of Skittles. Yeah. And it was like... <laughs> it's like, come on, let's be honest. And then there's one that w- w- I thought was, was wild, where basically one doctor said that eating an egg is the equivalent to smoking cigarettes, which I just, I, I can't get on board with that. I just, <laughs> I just thought it was ridiculous. We shouldn't make giant sweeping uh, judgments and, and, and leaps in terms of these things. I, I'm sure there are health detriments to both, but to say they're completely comparable just does not sit right, right with me either. Mm-hmm. And again, I, I respect some of the doctors in that um, that documentary. I do think they can, um, if given the right platform, present themselves in very professional, compelling and informative ways. I just didn't feel like that documentary was the right way for me uh i am optimistic however about the game changers which is coming out soon which looks specifically at the benefits of veganism for Mm. those who have athletic backgrounds and um fingers crossed that that will be um it it will it debuted at sundance and it's been positively received so far and i'm excited to see how that one approaches it compared to what the hell great so uh emeline if people are looking to get more into, well, no, you have something first, right? Yeah, we'll get a couple questions before we get to that. Yeah. Okay, quick, okay. Yeah, things. Are you, are you short for time at all, or are you good for another few minutes? I'm good. Okay, good. All right, so, um, what was the question I had? Uh, oh, man, you messed me up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, in... Okay, so yeah, I got it. So, so, our, so population right now we're at like closing in on what was it, like seven and a half billion, closing in on ten. Who knows where you know how how much it'll explode or if it you know if it kind of plateaus and starts to drop. But there might come a point where where eating insects will will be legitimately really important to our diet since they're kind of a high source of protein. Um, they they're small. Uh, you had they, to bring this up. Of, right? So There's a lot of insects. <laughs> so I guess I guess you already answered earlier. Like eating insects probably is not vegan, right? No, I have eaten an insect before I went vegan, though. I've okay. tried them. Okay. Um, not too bad, but um, most vegans wouldn't be okay with eating insects if we already have a possible and practicable alternative, for example, in beans and pulses and legumes. And uh, the United Nations is actually shooting more towards that than they are insects. They, uh, they, decreed, they decreed 2016, the year of the pulses, in an endeavor to try and get people to turn more towards that because they felt that was the sustainable direction forwards. But for obviously those who are in a circumstance where they're struggling, they're suffering and there is no other alternative again with anything like this if there is if it's a a matter of survival at its barest bones then yes you will probably eat those insects but if you have the alternative and you don't take it then that would not be vegan 
Well, as we said before, there might be lab-grown insects. Okay. Well, actually, yeah. I don't know. I don't think you asked the question. Is I think we'll go for the lab-grown burger. Yeah. It, now, would lab-grown meat be considered vegan? That is debated in the vegan really? community, actually, right now. So, obviously, at some point, inherently, that lab-grown meat will have had to evolve animals to some degree. But then you get to a point where there are no animals involved. It could potentially stop animals from being slaughtered, from suffering, and it could sustain people who really need it. So there are loads of benefits to lab-grown meat. And I think generally there's a buzz of excitement, but it's a bit cautious, especially seeing as... We, we again, we know that we have another alternative in place that, that doesn't involve animals and that is getting very scarily close to um, meat in some cases. I mean, I believe it's the Beyond Burger that's in America right yes. now, which is a, hmm. a burger that, try that. that's vegan, that bleeds. Have you tried it? I've tried it. I gotta How try is it. it. It's actually, it's actually pretty good. It really does taste like a beet. They eat, it tastes like a burger. They actually add beet juice to make it Ooh. look like blood. Yeah, but it's straight beets, and it, it's mostly it's mostly pea protein. Mm. Hmm. That's a non-starter. Exactly. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> we have these things instead, nice. so well, I gotta try we don't it. necessarily need. To. Yeah, you do. You've mainly gone vegetarian now. Is that correct? I or? have. I have. Well, congratulations. Uh, well, thank How you. Are you I'm, I'm I'm feeling good. I lost uh, I lost a little weight. I feel, feel pretty good in general. I'll eat some uh, you know some some eggs. I'll eat some some dairy uh, and uh, some, some fish on occasion. But yeah, I don't. Um, I, you know, that's the little thing I can do right now. That's brilliant. And honestly, every little helps. Every every step really does make all the difference. Hmm. So, so one other one other question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this one, the, 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 the plant sentience parts. question. Oh, so, so here we go. Ryan insisted so, on this one. <laughs> So some recent research, like, so there's been some recent research that plants do respond to information. So I guess the, yeah. the question is, you know, they, they can communicate, they respond to injury. Um, obviously, we don't know the the extent to which, but let's say hypothetically, there's some kind of weird plant neural network where they do have some level of sentience. Let's say equivalent to that of an insect. Um, mm-hmm. Does that then make plants not vegan anymore? Uh, well, firstly, yes, plants are very intelligent, fascinating. Um, living entities and i think it's amazing what they can do plants can feel pain or at least some plants can they currently well they as far as we fully know they lack the systems to care about that pain they can defend themselves as they see fit but it wouldn't bother them too much if they were in pain it's just a, a response like if your computer had a virus it's going to try and counteract that but it's not going to feel pain it's not going to feel distressed from it etc if a plant did feel distressed or if it if it had sentience similar to an insect then it's even more reason in some ways to try and turn towards conventional veganism as we know it now because yes it would be unfortunate that those plants have that that very base level of sentience but at the moment we're not only killing plants for ourselves, but we're killing them for animals and then feeding them to those animals so that we can then eat the animals rather than eat the plants. Uh, Animals are currently the biggest consumers of soy, factory farmed animals. So if we if we cared about these apparently theoretically sentient plants it would it would make more sense to to cut out the animal production as well because that's that's just multiplying their suffering to a huge magnitude. Interesting. So, yep, that's <laughs> well, But but, but that. technically would eating plants uh, still be uh, vegan? <laughs> I'm just trying to catch I you to technicality. Possible and practical. <laughs> Yeah. No. Ryan wants to be I, technically right. Yeah. 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 yeah what do you mm-hmm. eat? I, I think going with plants is a is a is a pretty safe bet. I think, huh? it's, a, I think it's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Plants are pretty pretty good in my opinion. <laughs> All right. So for um, for our listeners that are interested in maybe uh, being vegan or at least learning more about it, what are some resources that you like? Where, where there's some reading or what are some websites just anything that, that you would check out or you would recommend 
Um, yeah. So I would definitely recommend the book Vegan for Life, which is by Jack Norris and Virginia, Virginia Messina. Uh, that lays down the core nutritional fundamentals of going vegan. The Vegan Society website, uh, just Google the Vegan Society, you'll get there. Alternatively, it's theveganSociety.com. They have all of the fundamentals to go vegan. And if you sign up to go vegan with them, they will give you a pack. And for your first 30 days, they will guide you through the entire process. Make sure that you get your B12, which is the absolute essential. And they too have recently published a book um, which has all of the more intricate details about why someone might go vegan, how to best go vegan, etc., so those are two really good resources that can definitely help you um, out if you do want to try veganism. Alternatively, send me an email at emmelinepeaches at hotmail.com. I am always happy to talk to people and to try and help people along the way too. Great. Well, uh, Emmeline, thanks so much for coming back on the gym. It was another fantastic discussion. Sure. I, I, I hope there's a, another reason to, to get you back on. We'll have to find a good reason. <laughs> I'm sure we can make an excuse. <laughs> awesome. Oh, so, and thank you. Well, great. Thanks once again for coming on the Gym Wits, and we will speak with you soon. So what are the odds, Ryan, that you will one day be a vegan? I was thinking that as it was going on. See, I, I have this moral dilemma whenever I eat meat. So I'm trying to be better about you know, where I get the source. But the thing is, I don't cook anymore. Yeah, I don't cook yeah, as much. Yeah. So it's just hard for me to make that you know, choice. I, you know, I'd like to think that uh, you know my the first step for me is going to be once I can cook more that I you know just can make better choices about where I get my meat. I really I don't know if I can answer that fully though. Like I I'd love to I'd love to say that I would, mm. but it's just so hard. <laughs> it's tough. Yeah, yeah. Now Tony, you were a vegan for some time, correct? Yeah. So I was a vegetarian for five years, and I was vegan for one of one after that. Um, but then I was pretty. I wasn't. It's a long story. We could probably do a whole other um, podcast about it, but I have a very, very high gluten sensitivity. And when I was vegan and gluten free, it was very restrictive. And then I was also having like a lot of other issues. So for me, I consider myself a flexitarian where I eat meat, but I can have meatless meals. It's not like the main part of my dish. It's definitely, it's just more of a plant-based diet, not necessarily fully plant-based, but more plant-based, but I do incorporate meat products now. So if I were to switch, or not animal switch, products for that matter. But I think for me, it's just I would need like a personal chef sure, because sure. I, like I'm thinking when we were in Thailand, the, when we spent the few days on the elephant sanctuary, they the, she's completely vegan. Um, mm-hmm. So but but they have she has personal a personal chef um, or, or you know one of the housekeepers also sure, cooks. Sure. But everything was vegan and it was great. It was you know fantastic. And for the most part, for the entire time I was on the elephant sanctuary, I never felt like I was. I needed meat, you know, and even some of the, the kind of like, we had this one thing that was kind of like, it tasted like pork. Like if you would have told me it was pork, I just would have thought it was pork, but it wasn't. So, um, if I had a, per- I think I'd be much more likely to do it if, um, I was rich enough to have a, p- a personal chef who could or, cook vegan for Or me. prepare, or went to places with, so here's the problem because vegan is, has become more of a fad. A lot of the vegan type of restaurants take advantage of that. And to be honest, it should be really cheap to make vegan meals, yeah. you know, beans, rice, vegetables. They're, they're, they don't cost a lot, but because it's a popular demand, mm. there's an upsell there. Yeah. So I know you don't cook a lot and you do purchase a lot of your meals out. So you would just have to frequent vegan places yeah. or learn how to cook. Yeah. Right. Like, so yeah, I could see why that would be a struggle. Very like Emily was saying, there's, Gonna, there would be a learning curve for sure, yeah. and I guess I'm 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 just you might not be as willing as yeah, and yeah. that's oh, but that's okay because you like, know I, everyone has something that's going to work for them yeah. that doesn't going to work that's not going to work for them and it's that it's exactly that you have to want to do it first of all yeah and I do and it's like I like to cook and I you know it's just that I don't for now it's like time and practically but actually I was thinking you know vegan would be really tough because I like milk I like cheese yeah, yeah. I was yeah, just thinking and it's is honey considered vegan? Yes. Uh, it is considered vegan. No, no, honey is not vegan. Yes. It's it, not. No. There, there's a t- there is vegan honey. Well, but technically it's coming from, if you, if, by what Emmeline just said, and definitely from an ethical perspective, then honey is not vegan. Yeah, it's not, okay, it's not yeah, vegan. So, so, that, so you know what? I, honestly, I don't think I could ever go full vegan. But no, vegan. but I think there is vegan honey. Where is I, it I think there from? is. I, I don't know, but I, I've, I've, I've seen, or maybe it's a substance. Okay, substitute. but well, what are the cases? Like, yeah. I think the, you know what? It's like, 
steak, cheese, and honey. I can, I can, I'm starting to phase out pork. I don't eat as much pork as yeah, I, yeah. I usually, I used to. And I'm slowly kind of like phasing pork out, even though it doesn't make sense because cows are, you know, maybe not as intelligent as, as, yeah, yeah, as yeah. pigs. But, but, uh, but yeah, to answer your question, I don't know that I could because I, I like cheese too much. Mm-hmm. Until we come up with some, some fake well, cheese look. that's as good as the, the real stuff. Well, as, might uh, be problematic. As, as it's, hard. it's hard. It's hard. Do, do, you know, any step is, is a good one. Yeah. So just if you were to, you know, be a vegetarian, for yeah. instance. No, right? I like the approach. Um, it's definitely very. Although I'm not trying to convert reasonable. you because yeah, you know, no. you're not. You're not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I, I thought the uh, the interview was great. I think that Emmeline is uh, is is so uh, intelligent and articulate, yes. and puts things into such a sort of reasonable, reasonable and practical. Uh, gives the pre- reasonable and practical perspective on anything, and yeah. I think I that agree. she doesn't she she doesn't preach. But you know she lets her you know, she lets her opinions be known um, and her feelings. Uh, she doesn't preach and she puts it across in a way that very uh, professional. Yep, yeah. and I think that we can really take a lot from from what she says. <laughs> Politically, we could take a lot from that because <laughs> I think especially here on both sides, um, people get very preachy, and uh, you yeah, know it's yeah. not the way to win hearts and minds. Sometimes it's, it's like. You've got to be a little bit more pragmatic you, you and catch, speak to people. You, you catch more flies more. with honey, yeah. unless it's, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know. <laughs> so, so sometimes we need to, you know, it's a good way to approach things like that because you're not going to, it's really good. Like I'm not changing somebody's mind, um, sure. but if you can plant some seeds, you can slowly get them on your side. But if you, you know, fight them, sure. you know, tooth and nail, they're never going to want to come over to your yeah. side. Mm. So. Right, so we hope you enjoyed that. Um, hope you enjoyed the interview. Yep. Uh, as usual, you know where to find us, right? Yep. Uh, all of our stuff is at the uh, gymwits.com. Uh, you can email us at the gymwits at gmail.com. You can send a hate mail, whether you're angry at me for, uh, you know, if you love to hunt. Plant um, Or if you're a huge PETA person and you're mad at Justin. Um, I don't think, I don't know, to, I don't think Tony said anything. Uh, offensive to any groups today so i think you're off the hook but you could send uh your if you did then you can send your hate mail to tony at uh, the gym tony has a lot too. of other very so. weird <laughs> views that we won't bring up right tony? <laughs> what? <What's that? laughs> my way so, to play dumb so, <laughs> so anyway um you send us your stuff um one thing i will say is we've been getting some great emails from people uh, you know um, one of the more one of the really cool things about the podcast is that uh, we've get we've gotten emails and feedback um, from people that have been you know very genuine and um, really telling us how we've affected them or you know the impact the, the podcast has had on their lives whether it's professionally or personally and it's one of the more meaningful things um, of anything it's like kind of whenever I read an email um, or get that kind of feedback it makes me feel, you know this is worth it you know it's worth mm-hmm. you know it's worth doing this every week um, and it I mean it genuinely like it really um, makes our day. Um, to get that so you know keep sending your feedback uh, send your questions if you have asked the trainer question one of my favorite things though is we get the ask the trainer submission and it's like yeah I don't have a question just want to say you know you guys are really cool or whatever it is so that, that's really, really nice awesome. so um, we appreciate it and keep doing it uh, keep spreading the word uh, and also if you have a chance please fill out our survey at survey.lipson.com slash the gym wits I believe <laughs> um, survey.lisbon.com slash the gym wits and um, please just a quick survey one minute helps us infinitely um, with advertising and stuff like that so um, that is it where can people find you Tony uh, tips with Tony on Instagram Facebook or YouTube and if you have any questions that you want to direct to me you can either send to the gym wits or tips with Tony at gmail.com and don't forget to subscribe and subscribe to my podcast that they have helped me create the tips with Tony podcast if you want to also write a little review we wouldn't hurt we wouldn't yeah. hurt unless it's if it's not a nice review please don't <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah. if you have something positive to say um, that will help us. Yeah, if you want to pay us back, just reviews would be great. Reviews. Comments. All right. Yeah. Awesome. Well, that's it. Uh, as usual, I'm Ryan George. I'm Justin Guild, a.k.a. Chef Sonic, reminding you that truth does not sell. And I'm Tony Marinucci, a.k.a. Tips with Tony, a registered dietitian. And we are the Gym, the Gym Wits. Wits.